Welcome back to chapter number seven, part number two. Uh, we're going to continue on talking about thermochemistry, uh, more specifically heat uh, and a little bit of work, and then how we can, um, we'll start just maybe going through conceptually how we can solve some of these problems um, with, with regards to just maybe just giving you guys some uh, different ways to solve problems, assigning a couple practice problems. Um, and then uh, giving you, letting you guys, uh, I'll take a picture or scan my answers and then upload them to the site. Uh, still undetermined about that. Just depends on how much time we have. So we ended up this with this last time where uh, we talked about how we can calculate heat and work based on changes in temperature and volume, right? And so uh, we, we, we ended up with heat, which is Q. And, the, and so one thing that's gonna be very important in this section uh, is the idea of what's known as thermal equilibrium, right? Thermal equilibrium is the point with which there is no transfer of heat, no net transfer of heat, right? Heat e equilibrium is a dynamic process. It's constantly occurring, but there is no net transfer. There's no extra heat being transferred from one thing to another. Um, the heat absorbed by the system, which is Q, right? We, we call that Q, is directly proportional to delta T. And so... Um, right, so the change in temperature, it makes sense that if you add more heat, that the heat absorbed by the system is going to go up uh, proportionally. Um, you know, we, we talked about proportionally with the simple gas laws, um, but I'm not going to derive this equation. Just know that, right, Q heat is equal to delta T. Remember, what's delta? That's right, it's a state function. And whenever you see that delta, it's always final minus initial. So it would be the temperature final minus the temperature initial. Whenever we see that little uh, delta T, we'll see it again uh, later on with something else. Um, but then we have to multiply it by some constant. The constant that we're gonna multiply delta T with to make this uh, direct proportional and equate, or this direct proportionality and equation is C, which is called heat capacity. Heat capacity measures the system's ability to absorb thermal heat without going, without undergoing a large change in temperature, and so the higher the heat capacity, the less likely something is to change temperature. And so let's go ahead. The and and the and the uh, we'll, we'll talk about the units for these different things uh, because there are slightly different. So heat capacity itself is the heat required to change whatever we're looking at's temperature by one degree Celsius. This is an intrinsic property, just like uh, density. It doesn't matter how much of something you have, the heat capacity doesn't change. Now what does change is specific heat capacity, and this is what we're gonna be using for all of our heat calculations. And so the specific heat capacity is the amount of heat required to raise the temperature of one gram of the substance by one degree Celsius, right? So it would determine how much you would have, uh, would determine how quickly or, or how much it would be able to raise and how much heat it would actually be able to, to absorb. Now there is, uh, so that specific heat is, is looking at grams. We do have molar heat capacity which is looking at moles, like how much, uh, how, how many moles would it take to raise up uh, one, you know, one mole of the substance by one degree Celsius. But we're not, um, we're not gonna really do molar heat capacity, we're just gonna stick, uh, stick with specific heat capacity. Uh, on an exam, either I will give you specific heat capacity or I will ask you to solve specific heat, or solve for specific heat capacity because you, I'm not gonna have you memorize this table. Now let's look at this table. What we can see are just some common heat capacities of, of some common substances. And what, what are some things that you notice just by just quickly glancing at this? What are some things that you notice about the table? That's right. Uh, the metals, lead, gold, silver, copper, iron, aluminum, have very low heat capacities. What would, you, what would that be suggestive of those metals? That's right, that, that the small amount of heat or temperature change would lead to an increase. It wouldn't take much to change that, um, those, those elements uh, by one degree Celsius. And this is why they're used for cooking, right? This is why we use metal pans for cooking um, because they do have a low specific heat capacity. So there is a wider temperature range 
um, that we can use them in. Now, what do you notice, let's say, about water? That's right, water is the highest. If you've ever tried to watch a pot boil, you have experienced water's high heat capacity. It takes a lot of energy for, to, to raise the temperature of water. Um, this is why on hot plates in the lab, right, we try to turn them up as high as we can uh, because it does take that much heat uh, to do it. So what, what can we use? So, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to go to the next slide. We're going to talk a little bit about energy transfer, and then we'll go to the board and we'll solve a couple problems looking at heat. Then we'll look at work. Uh, and then um, we'll look at a couple ways on, on, on the way that we measure, at least one of the ways that we can measure this. Uh, and then by that time, we'll probably be done with part two, go into part three, which we'll talk about something completely different. Um, so we can use specific heat to find thermal energy transfer from one substance to another, right? We can calculate how much energy is transferred from metal to a hot piece of metal that we drop into some water. Um, and that's what we're going to do on the board. Um, but before we do that, what I want you guys to do is I just want you to simply calculate. There it is. All right. I just want you to calculate the problem in the red. And so what I've done is I've given you guys the heat equation using specific heat. The heat equation is Q, so Q stands for heat, is equal to mass, right? Because remember, the units for specific heat are, um, are joules divided by grams times degrees Celsius. That'll be important when we do our units. Remember, if we have a question about what units we need for an equation, just look to the constant. Um, and so what I've given you is a mass of copper, 3.10 grams. I've given you an, an initial temperature of copper was at minus 0, 8 degrees Celsius. And I've given you a final temperature of copper at 37 degrees Celsius. And I want you to find Q for me. And I want you to find Q. Everything is in the, in the units that they need to be in for you to just plug this in and solve it. All right, so let's go ahead and we're gonna erase this. So we can get as much board room as we possibly can for this next equation, or this next problem. Uh, this one is gonna be a doozy. This one's gonna take a little a wide ways, but that's fine. Again, make, just use one of the complicated equations to, so that you guys can see how to work through it. Um, and then, everything else would look simpler. So I have given you a, a bunch of different information over here. I've given you a mass of aluminum at 32.5 grams. I'm just gonna read these off in case you can't read them. Uh, the initial temperature of that aluminum is 45.8 degrees Celsius. The specific heat for aluminum is 0 0.903 joules per grams degrees Celsius. And what we're gonna do is we're gonna throw this chunk of aluminum into some water with a mass of 105.3 grams. The initial temperature of that water was 15.4 degrees Celsius. And the specific heat of water was 4.18, again, joules, grams, uh, degrees Celsius. And so there's a few things we have to remember. So this is gonna be a heat transfer equation, right? And so what we're, we're gonna see is the heat of the aluminum is going to be transferred into the water, right? And vice versa. And so that we know that the Q aluminum is going to be the opposite of the minus sign of the Q H2O, right? And, and we talked about that has to be because the energy transfer is going from the system. In this case, we'll, we'll define it as the aluminum to the surroundings, which is the water. So let's go ahead. And we're just going to, so I'm just going to plug in what we have up here into, these, into this equation. And you're going to look at it and you're going to think, oh, that is going to be uh, a doozy. So, but it's okay. We'll get it done. So let's see here. So we have 32.5 grams of aluminum. And we're going to multiply that by the specific heat of aluminum. And I'm just gonna, okay, joules, grams, degrees Celsius. And we're gonna multiply that by the change in temperature of the aluminum. Now, 
what you guys are probably thinking is, Dr. Bishop, you gave us an initial temperature, and I did. I am going to hold off on this because what it will do is it will make the math uh, a little bit easier. And so what this is going to equal is a negative 105.3 grams times 4.18 times delta T H2O. Okay, so what I'm gonna do is I'm, I'm, not, I'm not really gonna use the units here. The units will be the same on both sides. It'll end up with uh, delta C, and then what we'll actually do is cancel the units, um, and, so, and then reintroduce them, but that doesn't matter. So, let's, how in the world are we gonna solve this? Well, first, let's go and multiply the numbers that we can multiply, and so this is gonna be 29.5. 348 delta T of the aluminum is going to equal a negative, right? Because remember, it's the opposite, 440.15 delta T H2O. Okay? Told you this one's going to be a doozy. Let's go ahead and solve for this delta T of aluminum. You could solve for the other one if you wanted to. I just want to go ahead and solve for the delta T of aluminum. So delta T of aluminum is going to equal negative 14.998 delta T H2O. Like I said, holy moly. We can now break these apart, right? Because we said, what does this delta T mean? It means the temperature final minus the temperature initial, in this case of the aluminum, is gonna be minus 14.998 uh, temperature final, and I'm just gonna put these inside, right? Temperature final H2O minus temperature initial H2O. Um, what we're gonna do is, Let's go ahead and just multiply that through. So negative 14.998 temperature final H2O minus 14.998 or plus, excuse me, uh, temperature initial H2O. Now, Let's go ahead, and what I'm gonna do is I'm going to add temperature initial to that side, I'm gonna add temperature final to this side. And if I do that, then every, there, there will be no negatives. And all of the final temperatures will be on the same side, and all of the temperature initials will be on the same side. Plus, uh, you will also see why I do this. Temperature initial H2O. All right. Whew. Like I said, this is probably one of the just not complicated, but just a, a lot, a lot of steps to solve this. You will not be given this one or one like this on an exam. You may be given one like this on a practice. Um, again, just so that we can say, okay, this is what this equation is. This is how I can use it now. Here's where we have to think about something. What happens when we put a block of aluminum and we let it sit with some water? What will it eventually reach? We talked about this when we talked about heat. That's exactly right. It will reach thermal equilibrium. At thermal equilibrium, what about these two, whoops, I forgot. Ah, Skip a step. 14 TF H2O, there it is. What would happen to these two final temperatures, the final temperature of water and aluminum at thermal equilibrium? Exactly, they're gonna be the same. So what we can do is we can go ahead and just put TF instead of TF aluminum, TF water, and we can add those two together. And when we do that, we get this. Temperature initial, I'm running out of room, H2O. 
right? So because we, we're just going to take one, so this one out here plus the 14.998, since those two things are the same, we add them together, we get 15.998. Get the final temperature by itself, because that's what we want to solve for. So now we were given temperature initial of aluminum. We were given temperature initial of water. And so what we can do, so it's going to be 45.8 plus 14.998 times 15.4 divided by 15.998. And then temperature final. Temperature final is going to be in Celsius, 17.3 degrees Celsius. Oh, what a problem. But we did it. We did it. Now, let's just double check our math to make sure that we did it right, right? Because we don't want to do that much math and then be completely wrong. Um, so let's think about this. Which has a higher specific heat, water or uh, aluminum? Exactly, water. What is 17.3 closer to the, the, the temperature initial, water or aluminum? Exactly, water, which is makes sense, right? But heat was transferred to water, so the temperature would have increased a little bit, which is what it did. And so this is, so, so really it's, it's, it's not necessarily the math, the solving of the problem that, that's the most important, it's just the concepts within the problem, right? In that, oh look, our final temperature is close to this and not really close to that, but that makes sense because of this and that. Um, we know at thermal equilibrium, the final temperatures are going to be the same. And so we can use that to help solve the problem. And so that deals with heat. Now let's talk about some work, right? And, and what we're going to do is, is work is going to be the force, right? Work is force over distance, right? Over the distance. In this case, we're going to do pressure volume work. Um, we're going to mostly just stick with pressure volume work. Um, and so the vol as the pressure increases, right, the force, um, let me go ahead and write this equation out for you. But we're going to talk about pressure volume work. And we're going to talk about why we need the volume change equation uh, when we talk about uh, these pistons, uh, if you will. And then we'll talk about another caveat that we're going to have to think about and we're going to have to remember when we do these work uh, equations. So let's go ahead and actually get the camera right. Okay. So. I went ahead and erased what was that previous equation. You guys are probably like, you, yay. Work is equal to force over some distance, right? We talked about that at the in part one. Well, when we talk about a piston, when we talk about pressure volume work, the volume of the volume increase of a piston is the pressure is the force acting over some area, right? We talked about this. The pressure is some force uh, acting over some area, and we're talking about doing pressure volume work. Well, let's solve it for force. I don't know why I did that. A. So force is going to be the pressure times the area. So let's go ahead and what we can do is plug it back into this equation. And so now we have the work is equal to the pressure times the area times some distance. Well, distance in the pressure volume work of, let's say, a piston is the change in height. 
right? And and because it because it can only it only goes up and down, so it's the change in height. So then if we do work is equal to the pressure times a times delta h this right here area times delta h is very similar to b h which is the volume of a cylinder and so the work is equal to the pressure times the change in volume, right? And so the work is directly proportional to the change in volume. In this case of what we're gonna look at when we look at cylinders. Now, let's think about what this is though. Let's think about this. Work is, what unit is the SI unit for work? Exactly, it's in joules. What unit is the pressure in? we'll say atmospheres, it's not necessarily the SI, right? Because the SI is Pascals. And what about the volume, right? The volume is in liters. Well, we have atmospheres, liters equals to joules. If we think about this in kinetic energy, you know, we know joules equals this. If we were to solve it out and look at the unit, right? We, kilograms times meter squared times second squared this, does not equal that. So I will tell you, and this is where many students kind of miss points on work when they calculate work. So hint, hint, nudge, nudge, that one atmosphere liter, and you can't see that, so let me go ahead and draw it over here. That one atmosphere liter, and you will get this conversion factor is equal to 101.3 joules. And so we have to remember when we do a work calculation that our units are going to end in atmosphere liters, right? Because we're doing pressure volume work. And so we have to remember that work is a unit of energy or is energy. And so we have to convert it into a unit of energy, which in this case would be joules and so how do we go into the lab to calculate this stuff at least for this and so what we can do right because so so what we see right is the internal energy of a system is the amount of work and heat that is in that system and they're constantly being transferred again transferred from system to surroundings or from surroundings to systems and so what happens if we were to carry out a reaction at a constant volume, right? So, so we know work is the delta V, right? The change in volume. So if it's constant, remember delta means final minus initial. So if final equals initial, what happens to that unit? Exactly. It goes to zero. And so we don't have to worry about work. So all we're going to find is heat, right? And all we're going to use is heat. And that'll be a, a, when done at a constant volume, we can use the change in temperature and measure the heat change between the systems and the surroundings. And what's pictured here is one of the ways that we do that. Um, and so, and, and that is the bomb calorimeter, right? The bomb calorimeter is actually how we determine uh, the calories that are in your food. Um, and so, uh, and, and what happens is, is they light a little fire, um, they ignite really, they blow up. If you want to think about it, whatever sample they're looking at, they check, the change in temperature, they're able to use uh, the calculations um, to calculate how much uh, calories, how much heat is in that system. And so um, next time, part three, we're gonna start talking about enthalpy.